very smart looking thumb. What does he look like today? Is he tired? Oh, he's tired. Look at those bags under his eyes. Oh, no, Thumb. You'll be all right. You can have an afternoon siesta, of course. Now, we've got a couple of giraffe. I just want to go forward. We can see if we can get a better view of one of these giraffe. There's a nice view. Good morning. And you can see straight away that this is a young male. Just munching away. And it's easy to tell that that is a young male because the ossicones, the little horns on top of their head, you can see quite clearly are bald, just in case you are watching for the first time. Now remember, you are watching a live safari at the moment. And if you'd like to chat to myself or James, well, we'd love to hear from you. And you can send us some questions by either hashtagging Safari Live on Twitter or you could send us an email at questions at wildearth.tv. Now, I'm not sure what James's plan is this morning, but I'm sure it will involve at some point searching for the Nkahumas. However, I'd like to try and find a spotted cat. And I would love to go to Cheetah Plains, of course, to go and look for the leopard. Hopefully quarantine, maybe somebody else, maybe Nkanyeni's around. I still yet to see her cubs, but I think let's not waste too much time. Thank you very much, Giraffe, for showing your faces very briefly. Let's continue on the road. Now, we're also checking the southern boundary, of course, because it feels as though it's about that time that Karula and her two beautiful darling cubs are going to come across. Actually, there's another species of animal with a giraffe that I've just noticed. Have a look at that. Now, where we were viewing them, there were lots of trees and I didn't see the buffalo moving in between the giraffe's legs. And isn't this amazing? Because now you can really get an idea of the size of a buffalo. Now, the two that we're looking at, they aren't particularly large. They look like two youngsters, a young bull closest to us. But you'll see that a, if a giraffe was willing, that buffalo, and the buffalo was willing, they would quite happily fit straight underneath the legs of the giraffe and not even touch its belly. Isn't that amazing? But now the giraffe didn't hang around long enough, of course, to do that. They could have had a game of limbo this morning. It would be quite an interesting limbo game to play. What do you think, hey, Brian? Safari limbo. Right, but let's continue on. Now. I'm going to search very carefully before I even think of going to Cheetah Plains looking for some leopard tracks crossing into Juma. But I know that James would very much like to actually say, well, officially, sorry, say hello to you. Good morning, everyone. It always feels a little odd saying good morning again after the pre show shenanigans, but here we are officially on the show show. Yes, that's what we're on. My name is James Henry. David is on camera. Good morning, David. Good morning. Yes, very nice. I see that your hat matches your jacket. That's very nice indeed. He's branded to the max today. Of course, we don't show any branding on the show, so he has to remain behind the scenes. You've met Taylor already. She's being filmed by Brian, obviously, whose thumb I'm sure you've seen. We are heading up towards Biffleshook Dam. Now, there are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, the Inkahuma Pride has been around here. Five Leonesses and their eight cubs, perhaps a male with them too. But there was the death from, we think, natural causes in Biffleshook Dam a few days ago. Uh, that hapless animal was pulled out of the water by the Juma staff and then Two others Taylor found there yesterday. I think it was Taylor. May have been Byron. Anyway, in in the water, not looking good at all. So we're going to go and see if they're still there. Maybe the lion's at the dam. I think it's a good place for us to start. That is the plan of the morning. Please do talk to us during the course of the, after the morning. It's not an afternoon. Well, it is afternoon somewhere in the world. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. It would be nice to hear from you. And uh, we can talk about anything you like within reason. We can talk about Africa, South Africa, the Kruger, wilderness in general. We can talk about the animals that we hope to see, the animals that we do see. And just appreciate while we do this, it has been such a boon time out here. Boon time, sorry. Because this part of the Sabi Sand, which is the uh, sort of western edge of the Kruger Park that we call home, 
has had so much rain in comparison with the southern ends of the Sabi sand. And so we've had an astonishing number of wildebeest and giraffe and water buck and impala, all of them here. And around every corner, around every bush, there's been something to see. That time, everybody, will not last forever. Nothing lasts forever, David. No. Except baldness. That does seem to last forever. Now, Ellen, in Arkansas, the question of the rapidly dying buffalo has uh, uh, sort of piqued your interest. And I think that they are dying because the grass is not long enough for them to eat yet. So let's just look at this patch of grass here, David. Let me jump out the car. If Taylor finds anything of astounding worth, you, Kirsten, will tell you, David. And you will tell me, all right? Oh, good. Now, Ellen, when a buffalo feeds, what it does is it wraps its tongue around a long piece of grass, pulls that out, and then puts it into its mouth. It, do, it does have bottom teeth. Obviously, none of, the, none of these herbivores, the ruminant herbivores, have got top teeth. But it, it, doesn't, it seems to lack the ability to take grass this short. Now, all of this grass, and I think that you're partly correct in what you say, this grass is ideal for something like an impala. It's ideal for a wildebeest or a zebra. Uh, probably slightly short for a zebra, but the zebra are managing. But for buffalo, it really isn't ideal at all. And that means that they're not eating this new grass, I don't think. So it's been kept short like this, as you say, by impala, zebra, wildebeest, other um, grazing animals. What they are eating, however, is this sort of stuff. They're browsing. Now this, and as we know, I mean, I've fed this to all the cameramen many times, it's full of tannins, full of various other chemical defenses that I don't know about, and it tastes horrible. It really is disgusting tasting, and... Uh, you really got to have a digestive system capable of dealing with it in order to derive nutrients from it. And that's what the buffalo cannot do. They can do it from time to time. Most animals can mix feed slightly. Sorry, David, I'm just going to go ahead to a flower over here. I'll bring it back to you. Um, most animals can do it intermittently, but you will find that it's rather difficult for buffalo to do it continuously and eventually it's going to have an effect on their guts and that's why I think they're looking so thin because we have had rain the warthog is certainly putting on condition impala taking a bit longer but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that a friend of mine got hold of me yesterday and told me some interesting stuff this is quite cool any idea what these are David? Nope. you see they have five wings normally this plant has got four wings this one's five-winged. It's a cumbretum, so it's a bush willow, everybody, but it's called the river bush willow, not river bush willow, the climbing bush willow, cumbretum mozambicensi. It's the first one of those I've found here. It's quite nice. Okay, let us continue. Now, what I was going to tell you was that a friend of mine got hold of me yesterday after I said on drive that Impala that the males were faring a lot worse, I thought, than the females. Remember I said that to you yesterday? And then Steph reiterated that where he lives in Hootsprate, he said the male, water, uh, the male warthogs are looking pretty ropey in comparison with the females. The females are looking good. Apparently, this is an almost universal mammal phenomenon. So I said this on Drive yesterday, and a friend of mine got hold of me because he thought it was quite interesting, and he did a whole lot of research, and he said... Uh, you know, it's actually, it's been noticed in species, mammal species from throughout the world that males recover far less easily from droughts and times of stress than the females do. And I think that's probably because, from an evolutionary perspective, because females, of course, are far more necessary to the raising of youngsters, so they need to be able to put on condition more. So perhaps the males just don't worry about it enough. Now, they don't look after themselves sufficiently. And so that's why the male impala are looking ropey compared with the females, which I think is rather amazing, especially given that the females are all pregnant and about to give birth, which means their physiological demands are that much higher than the males, who just have to find themselves sufficient to eat. So, David, let that be a lesson to you. 
If you go through a drought, make sure you eat properly. Well, as you too will start like, looking like a ropey impala, where the ladies will not. They shall maintain their magnificence, their feminine fantasticness. Right, we're popping up onto the hill here, round about where the Ninkapumas were yesterday, so let's keep a, an eye out. I, of course, have yet to see them killing a buffalo. Everybody else in the whole world has seen the Ninkapumas kill a buffalo. I am not one of them. There is a buffalo. It is not dead, though. Nor is it being attacked, set upon, by five lionesses. We'll just have a quick look at him because I don't want to go down there, I want to go straight towards the dam. Although, there are no tracks coming along here. Anyway, there he is. I know you've seen a buffalo already. Hang on, that's quite, there is one quite interesting thing here. You see that patch on his back there, Dave? Now, Chris, your question is going to lead me on to another topic. I just want to quickly look at this buffalo. I don't want to get too close to this stage. I don't want him to run. You see that wound on his back? There. That is exactly where a lioness might start biting if she jumped onto the back of a buffalo. Now, I'm not sure that that's what that is, but it is possible. Now, he looks much better to me than many of the others we've seen. He looks like he's in pretty fine shape. But he's browsing still. You see, he's not eating grass. He's eating new young tree leaves of that pterocarpus there. So, Chris, you're saying are there any plants or any flowers that the buffalo might be eating that could be poisoning them? Um, well, they are slowly poisoning themselves by eating only the leaves of trees like that. But in terms of flowers, no, I don't really think so. But I do think that the bovine tuberculosis that is in the area that is effect that affects all buffalo of the Kruger Park. I think that is definitely having an effect. Um, it doesn't affect any animal that is nutritionally balanced, nutritionally well fed, and doesn't have some other kind of disease. I mean, a lot of human beings carry tuberculosis and it never expresses because they eat sufficient, so it doesn't bug them. But I do think that the TB is affecting the buffalo. Oh dear, that's called reverse by touch, everybody. Scott Dyson taught me how to do that. Oh, Robin D, you say, do any animals like to eat flowers? I like to eat flowers. There are a whole lot of flowers in our fridge at the moment. Nasturtiums, I think they're called. And uh, yes, they're, they're definitely edible. Uh, Robin D, there are absolutely lots of flowers that animals like to eat. I am not sure how many there are out here, but certainly there are also some toxic ones. But yeah, lots of animals will eat flowers out here, and some flowers are designed to be eaten. Or certainly the fruits that come thereafter. I can't think of a particularly obvious example though, but I've most certainly seen flowers being scoffed by various animals. Okay, Bilfosok Dam is right around the corner. I'm just going to drive a little bit faster. We don't want to find the lions as they kill the buffalo. We want a little bit of a build-up, don't we? Of course, now that I expect them to kill a buffalo in front of me, they almost assuredly won't. Morning, Glory. I think you, I think that it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. You say the females, of course, many of them of the antelope, the warthog, and that sort of thing, are pregnant, producing more estrogen as a result of it. And because of the estrogen that they're producing, um, you say, oh, is, is that maybe why they're in better condition? I, I'm sure that's got. A, I'm sure that's got to do with it. I suspect, though, it's an interaction of all sorts of complicated things. There's a impala, which means the lions are almost certainly not here. In fact, the only thing that's here is a hippopotamus. 
Right, well we'll turn around to the top of the dam wall here. And there's some water buck there. So Morning Glory, I think you'll find it's a whole big suite of different hormonal interactions um, that contribute to the fact that of course the females need for the good of their babies to be in better condition than the males. Now that will come with a cost. I mean there will be a cost to that. It's not just that they are better at it than I, I don't know what that cost will be. It might simply be that the time that they have to spend feeding, uh, the stress involved could be a lot greater than it is for the males. Very quiet dawn chorus today. Very little bird song in comparison with some of the other mornings we've had. It's 23 degrees as I said to you earlier, 74 Fahrenheit. The wind coming out of the southeast. There was supposed to be some rain today, but that warning has uh, sort of, um, what was the word I wanted today? Oh yes, withered away. That warning has withered away, and we think it's going to be pretty hot today now. Right, well, that is quite interesting. Let's go and turn around. That was some water back at the end of the end of the dam there. There is a vulture way in the distance, so we might pop across there, but I don't think the vulture... I don't think the vulture would have got there during the course of the night. No, it wouldn't. There it is, looking very ominous. See, it's tucked its head in there. Just hiding its head from the wind. <laughs> okay, we'll turn around here and go back around. We'll go to where that dead buffalo was, or is now, see if the lions haven't decided to eat that rather than kill a fresh one. Hello Lisa, you're a new viewer. Marvellous to have you with us. Thank you for joining us and thank you for sending your question. You say, does the bush, I think your question is, does the bush ever get too thick for us to view animals? Well, the bush will get much, much thicker than it is now and that is a result of the rain and the fact that the summer season will continue and so the leaves will get more, the grass will get longer and the bush will get thick and come February, yes, game viewing will be not impossible but it won't be nearly as easy as it is now. So we're really having great game viewing time at the moment. Um, it never gets too thick for us to look at, but people often say, when should I come to Africa or to South Africa? When's the best time? And, I mean, there is no best time. But what I will say to you is that uh, if you want to see the easiest game viewing time is definitely at the end of winter. Oh, David, that smell is something else. It's the end of winter, everybody. And the end of winter is uh, sort of August to October. There's the buffalo. It's very dead. The lions have not had a go at it. But the vultures have. Amazing that an animal should get uh, fatter in death than it was in life, isn't it? Quite impressive. Poor thing. So if in case you weren't watching everybody, this buffalo, which of course is no longer with us, uh, died in the water the other day, probably you know, as a result of the drought, be it from TB or be it from just starvation or be it from uh, poisoning itself. Now normally in an ordinary sort of year or in an ordinary time you would find hyenas and lions eating this thing because any piece of uh, food that is left out will be devoured. This will be eaten eventually by various things, but because there is so much around, so much food around at the moment, the lions haven't even bothered with it. This is disgusting. Let us leave here quickly. Lucky we haven't had breakfast yet, David. Yes. yes. Otherwise we'd feel nauseous.
I don't know where that other little one I don't know where that other little one went. We'll go and find out shortly. Okay, while we try and figure out what's happening with the lions, Taylor is on her way to Cheetah Plains. Let's find out how the long road to the east is faring. So there hasn't been too much around, just a couple of impala here and there off into the distance and I've been driving quite slowly just checking the roads to see if I can spot Karula's delicate little paw prints and see if they've come across or perhaps uh, Tingana's rather larger paw prints crossing over but uh, sadly nothing just yet and at the moment there's nothing around us. Brian, why are all the animals evading us today? There's nothing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to slowly make our way towards Cheetah Plains though. We're going to just have a double check because this is a quite a nice sandy spot. And if anything is crossed over, we should surely see them. Let's have another look here. Hmm. Here's a nice big pathway. Now, if you have a look at the, this animal pathway, though you can't see it as prominently anymore. You can just see how it sort of starts and then veers off to the left as the grass is starting to come through and at one point it looked like these pathways were manicured by us as humans now that would be a very good point for an animal like a leopard or a lion even just a, an impala to casually walk along that pathway cross the road and then of course enter and cross the other side but it doesn't seem as though anything we're looking for has crossed in this area but we shall persevere and we shall continue trying until we get something let's see there's a couple of looks like a couple of elephants were around here but maybe late last night and it's quite windy as well so some of the tracks are quite windblown which is not good for us on this road as it could have sort of hidden Karula's tracks and made them look very much hyena like Let's take it very easy. You can have a look here. Look at how the elephants were having an absolute field day. Let's see. I'm just going to stop here. But you can see they were walking up and down, all around, obviously feeding along the road. And it seems as though we're going in the right direction. Sorry, I was in the way there. Of course, to try and find these elephants. Let's have a look. Hmm. Now, as we're driving along here, trying to figure out where these elephants have gone, I know that Velma was saying that the last time she was here at Duma, she noticed that the elephants had taken down quite a few trees. We can actually see the devastation just over here. And you were wondering that once the drought is over, how long will it take before they sort of stop feeding on the trees? Now, it's not that they'll stop feeding on the trees, it's just that the, the feeding behavior and looking for bark, like you can see here, you can see how they've snapped it off and then started to strip the camium layer from the sort of harder, harder outer bark. And it's just going to get less and less and less frequent as the grass comes through, as the nice leaves come out as well. But I suppose bark is quite tasty and it's a good source for, for moisture as well. So they will, they will feed on that still. Remember, we've been seeing those elephants crunching on the bush willow roots and like I said I always describe it it's like something like they're eating an ice lolly of of some sort I can hear a couple of birds it sounds like a couple of prinias let's see if we can find one but now the thing about a tawny flanked prinia is that it's a very small little bird and they don't often stay out and call on the top of the thickets for too long Normally, because they're so small, they feel quite vulnerable, and you'll often see them jumping around in the small shrubs. I'm just double checking. Nothing around here. Karula, when are you going to come back and pay us a visit? We miss you. I was hoping to do a, 
a track quiz at some point and I thought that this that uh, Gowry Main would probably be quite a nice road to do it but unfortunately it seems as though is that there's only very easy ones and I think you all know an Impala track too well by now so we shall skip the Impala track so let me let me see if I can find a nice one here an interesting one maybe a creature of the night that was perhaps patrolling up and down this road well, I won't, okay, I won't actually be able to do it here because I've seen some buffalo just up ahead. And that's no good for us to get out, so let's take a look at the buffalo. Hi, guys. Oh, shame. Now, here's another Duggar boy. And he once was a beautiful specimen. But like James was chatting about earlier, the effects of the drought are noticeable. Now, if you have just tuned in and you're possibly wondering about this drought, seen as though you're seeing lots of green vegetation around, this green vegetation has only just started coming through. We had some nice rain in September. It then brought lovely luscious grass through and the animals seemed to sort of fatten up. But then we had a couple of weeks where it went very dry again. And of course, the rain that we had about a week ago just came too late. As you can see that this buffalo is browsing. Now, he should not be doing that. They are bulk grazers. It's only about 5% of their diet or so that they will actually feed on leaves. But their stomachs are designed not to digest leaves at all. They digest the proteins and the cellulose and grasses better than the ones in the leaves. So often during these times, these tough times during the year, if you find buffalo feces, you'll see that it's a little bit more wet than it normally would be because it causes uh, agitations in the stomach and then it causes diarrhea. And you often see whole leaves, typically leaves from the round leaf teak. And I haven't really seen any new leaves off the teaks just yet. The animals love to browse on them. Even the zebra will browse on a round leaf teak. Hello, Buff. Don't worry, the grass is coming through. You need to head to quarantine open area. As there you will find lots and lots of grass. And hopefully you'll be able to eat yourself back to the condition that you were. And he doesn't look particularly old. You can see his horns are still beautiful and, and intact. He doesn't have too many scars and battle wounds. And the tip of his horns seem to be quite sharp. But I think... Not only does the condition, their weight sort of uh, drop off of them during these times, is that you find that they don't really have enough energy to continue with their daily routines. For instance, like when they sharpen their horns or rub their horns on the tree, all those types of things, the grooming process, all tend to slow down as it uses valuable energy. And at the moment, they're just trying to survive. And there's another buffalo that has sat down and is not really doing much either just sitting off to the side there it looks like a female she is ruminating though so that's a good sign now we're about to head into a dodgy little dip and I don't want to lose you so before I just disappear I'll politely say goodbye for just a moment and let's head across to James We have not had a great deal of luck here yet, everybody. Not even a track of a lion at this stage. I'm hoping we won't have to go blasting into where David and Taylor went bravely yesterday evening. But I suspect we might have to. Here is a beastly looking vulture. Oh, he's taking off. He didn't like being called beastly, did he? Of course, I'm not casting aspersions on the vulture's character, everyone. I'm just saying that, you know, they do look a little ominous at times. Good. Now, you may have noticed that I've put my jugget on, and that is because it is a little, a little cold. Now, we're going to drive very slowly through here and see if we can't find some tracks or just the lions themselves. But I'm interested at this stage that we... Ha, ha, here we go. Those tracks are fossilized. They're going in that way. One track of one female. 
They're actually not that old. Did you come out of here yesterday, Dave? Yeah, a bit further on. A bit further on. But there was only one track of one lady. Maybe she went for a drink during the course of the night. Wassailing is what she was doing, David. She was wassailing. Did you cross the drainage line from here? Yeah. Gosh, that must have been some adventure. Down through there? Yeah, further on. Further on. Let's just keep an eye out on the road. So excuse me not looking into your eyes, everyone. There are many, many buffalo carcasses around here. Some of them naturally dead, some of them being killed by the lions. It was down through there. Okay, I think there's probably a slightly easier approach from Central Road then. We'll go and check Central Road. If we cannot find anything on this road. This is Gwari Pan. Yeah, it doesn't look like they've popped out here at all. We're fighting our way in, David. Well, we'll do it if we have to, but let's, uh, let's hope we don't have to, really. Now, we're getting to the point where we saw that buffalo bull, but just from the other side. In fact, we're now at that point. Ah. What a lovely name. Once upon a time, very nostalgic name. Um, once upon a time, a good and a valid query, and one that I'm struggling to answer myself. You say, why is it that there are no hyena around? Where are they? And uh, the obvious, I guess, what's precipitated that, of course, is the fact that there are dead things everywhere. We all know that hyenas like to eat dead things, so why are they not here eating those dead things? I think it is because, once upon a time, just north of us in the Manuleti, there are an equal number of dead things. And there's just such a glut of food at the moment that they don't need to come through here. So our clan of hyenas, for whatever reason, moved north into the Manuleti. I think they did that because uh, well, two or three of their den sites were on major lion paths. They were on paths that the lions were using often to sort of mark their territory. And I think that resulted in them deciding to uh, pack their bags and head north, as it were, which is what they did. And then their need to come patrolling down here to the south has been negated by the fact that up in the Manuleti where they are there has been as much in the way of easy prey as there has here on Juma. So I think that's why we're not seeing that many hyenas. I hope that's why we're not seeing that many hyenas. I haven't seen a hyena in fact or a hyena track for oh, I don't know many many weeks. There is the same buffalo that we saw first up. We'll just have a quick look at him before handing it back to T-Bomb, who's got some chestnut red antelope to show you. And there we go. Very pretty, David. Gorgeous. Right, back to Taylor and her antelope. You just came back at the right time. <laughs> How cool is this? All the boys chasing each other out around, getting quite riled up and making strange noises. Now it's very funny to see because there's a couple of young sort of up and coming Impala. They've still actually got a couple of years to go, but they're getting quite cheeky chasing the ladies around. But they better be careful because there's some big boys that are almost twice their size that will keep them in check. You could see a few of them sort of rounding everybody up. But now they seem to have all scattered all over the show. And I love it sort of at this time of the year where there isn't really too much competition. The female's about to give birth and then, well, of course, all the males are around. And they're not just limited to the bachelor herds. They're actually able to sort of mix in between everybody else isn't that wonderful that was such a nice 
the little impala shot. And you know, I know James always likes to say you have to stop and view the impalas at least once a day. And I think that, that that's as good as an impala sighting is going to get today. Unless, unless we catch one with a little lamb, a new lamb, the first one of the season perhaps. Or if we can get one actually giving birth, that's always quite incredible. But we will continue on a little bit further. We're almost at Cheetah Plains. We're not too far now, which is quite exciting. Probably another eight minutes or so of, of my tortoise driving and then we'll be there. But before we even get there, it's probably going to be a bit longer as we've stumbled across a herd of elephants. Hi Elise. And we've been seeing so many of them, but it looks as though they're moving back out of sort of the Juma area and going back south. And this is what they're going to do. It seems as though finally most of the sands has actually had some rain. So I just dropped my lip ice onto the ground. And that means that in about a week from now or so, some of the areas down in the south that haven't seen a drop of rain just yet is going to have lovely lush grass coming through, which isn't the greatest news for us. That means that everybody is going to go back down south. It's incredible how the animals really follow the rain, but hopefully the new growth that we are experiencing is going to keep them here for a little bit longer. But it doesn't seem like a big herd. One, two, three, four. I think there's about five elephants here, four or five elephants. So just a very small group. Let me see if I can go forward a bit and get a better view. Mm. Oh, she's quite a big female. Let's have another. Oh, it's, but it's so thick. This is down. The only problem, of course, with this time of the year is the vegetation. Oh, she might come out to a gap. Look how large she is. She's a really big girl. She's got a very big set of tusks on her. Are you coming out to say hello, lovely lady? Oh, she looked like she was eating a tuba or, or something like that. Let's see. I was wondering why she had her trunk curled up and holding it into her mouth. And that explains that she obviously dug up a root of some sort or a bulb. And it actually split into two and she dropped half of it on the ground. There we go. She's probably looking for another little titbit. Here it is. And now that is going to be delicious and juicy as she crunches away into that. Hello Elise. Morning. Oh, she actually seems to be struggling a little bit. She keeps picking it up and putting it in her mouth and then it drops out. Maybe there's a couple of unfavorable bits on there. And she's trying to separate them from the, the juicy section, which she really wants to eat. And we should go going for the final piece. And I must say that this elephant has got particularly good table manners. Because I can't really hear her crunching. It's either that or the wind is muffling the sound. It's one of the two. I'll go with good table manners, though, this morning. Oh, the cold weather is actually moving in now. Yesterday from it being quite hot in the day prior to that. And today, it's a little bit chilly. Perhaps when the sun comes out, it'll burn away the clouds. But I think that it is we're building up for some rain over the next couple of days, which is fantastic and quite exciting. Let's hope for another 20 mils of rain or so. And if the clouds keep moving in like the way they are, well then we should be in for a great surprise. And she's still feeding on her bulb. That has to be the final piece now. I don't know what she dug up. The, it was massive. And you can see a bit of a root that she's got from part of that tuber or bulb that she was feeding on. And you've watched it with Steph before, where he's cut open a bulb and squeezed it.
Hello big girl, no, it's very quiet. Now, Justin, you were wondering what the difference between ivory and teeth are. Uh, now, I'm not sure that there is too much of a difference really. I, I'm just trying to think off of the top of my head because technically the tusks of an elephant, and it's the same thing with a warthog, they're, they're adaptions of the teeth. Now, I can't think that there'd be any real difference. I suppose though the only difference is that, that they are longer. I mean if you look at a tooth and you, you feel ivory now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a piece of ivory before. I found a chipped off uh, elephant tusk obviously from bulls fighting and I had a little look at it. You occasionally find things like that lying around in, in the bush. And then also when we were in Zambia uh, I was able to see some beautiful tusks which was quite sad though. We, they had caught a poacher who had poached an elephant and luckily managed to confiscate the ivory from him. So I was able to have a look at these tusks. And it was very sad because it was a beautiful thing. And, and they feel very much like teeth. The only difference is that they get so much longer. And I suppose because they're exposed out to the conditions, they sort of weather a little bit. But now I can't, I honestly just, just now I can't think off the top of my head if there really is too much of a difference. There must be though, but maybe you can help me. It seems as though my brain is a little bit asleep this morning and it's a really good question uh, that you've asked but I shall either do some research a little bit later and get to the bottom of that. We'll have a look, little look but I suppose you all have access to the internet so if you'd like to help me or maybe just we can even have a discussion about it that would be wonderful and I'd love to hear from you and what your thoughts are. You can either hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can send a little response or a comment through to Questions at wildearth.tv And I just can't get over how big she is. She's got very nice tusks. Now normally the females don't get very big tusks. I've seen one or two, no, I've seen two big tuskers in Addo, which was actually quite unusual to see for, for the females. It's because down there, unfortunately, they experience quite a lot of inbreeding at one point. It was just a, only a handful of elephants that were sort of saved from the Eastern Cape area and then they were reintroduced to a big national park called the Addo Elephant Park. And over time they had not introduced new genetics to the point where they started to see the effects of inbreeding and one of them was the fact that females were being born with no tusks. Now we see it out here and it, it's, it's common for females to not have a, either have no tusks or one tusk but down there it was almost every single female that didn't have any tusks and I was able to see two very large, oh my goodness, two large females with tusks but that's about it they really do enjoy these bush willow trees, another variable bush willow I think the, the roots are particularly tasty, she had a go, she pushed that tree a bit and then I think she decided nah, we'll go off and try and find something else and I'm quite glad that she continued doing that because that tree may have landed on our vehicle, it's not a small one but off they go into the distance, it seems though there's actually quite a few of them all here but they're in this very very thick vegetation that little one managed to pick up a little bit of grass, you can see now the grass coming through just searching there for a sprig that's long enough to pull out of the ground and of course that's what they ideally would prefer because it is the tastier option. Now we're going to go back across to James though who has got some vultures. Perhaps they're sitting in a tree. Well they ain't flying about the place I'll tell you that for free. It's so cold out here they ain't going to fly until it gets a lot warmer. Uh, the most interesting thing about that vulture sighting is the white-headed vulture there which is not a common bird. He's vast, well he's about the same size as those um, <clears throat> white-backed vultures and isn't he just a wonderful colour? I'll just describe his colours to you. He's, uh, got blue and red on his beak and then he's pied so he's black and white on his body and he's got a very white head David which is why he's called a white vulture. correct white-headed vulture very good they are not common at all 
Now, the lions, everybody, we have searched the, we've done a, a circumnavigation of the block, and although it's possible, oh, there he goes, it's possible that I've missed the tracks. I don't think I have. And so what we're going to do is drive into the block to exactly where Taylor had them yesterday and try and find out from there what's going on. <coughs> no, I don't think they've come out. I was a little worried that they had perhaps headed to Torchwood. And I was worried about that because apparently the, there were three Birmingham males on Torchwood yesterday evening. And our torchwood's just off to the right-hand side, only about, I don't know, 200 metres, um, so almost a thousand feet to the boundary. And then we, of course, cannot go across there. We must stay on our traversing area if we wish to avoid being arrested. No one wants to be arrested, David. Nope. nope. So, we're going to drive relatively smartly around to where Taylor went off-road and then we're just going to bungle in there and see if we don't get lucky. The sand is quite soft here, you see. The road has just been kind of uh, dragged or graded slightly and therefore the tracks are fairly easy to see. David, you're having some iced water there, I see. Oh, well, you're getting hot. A little bit hot. Shame. I don't think it's very hot at all. What else can we see around here? There's it's kind of devoid of things. Hello, Margaret. You are very observant. And you say, are oh, David and Brian the only cameramen that we have at the moment? Yes, we fired the others. I'm afraid they were too hopeless for words, so we got rid of them all. Um, no. Uh, the reason that they... You're absolutely right. They're the only two guys that have been on site for a long time now. And the reason for that... Well, there are, sorry, Dave. The vultures flying... Down or up? Now, I think they've been frightened off the ground by something. Although... No, they're going down. You know where they're landing? They're landing on that carcass. Look, watch, here comes another one. It goes. They're going straight down over the top of this block onto that buffalo carcass at Buffalzog Dam. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. Okay, so we know where they're going. The question is, why are they suddenly taking off now? I think it's because there are lions inside here. Uh, the other two, uh, jean Dri and Viam and Exy to a certain extent, they're all on leave at the same time and two of them coming back today I think simply because those TV rehearsals that we'll be doing and we'll be doing a whole lot more next week uh, that will they kind of bring, mean the whole crew has to come on so the, the leave cycles get tossed out of kilter and that's why we've been sort of, uh, well, I what hesitates to use the term abusing, but um, certainly why David and Brian have had to work so very hard over the last two weeks. Well done, David. Mm. David hasn't complained at all. Stoic fellow that he is. Oh dear. I see we're back with this rather distressing antenna. Where's my, where's my selfie stick? The fact that there is so little general game in this block tells me that there probably are some lions knocking about. Now David, I want you to tell me where you went off road yesterday. And then we shall follow from there. Very important. Now, there are a whole lot more Walchers over there, which is Walcher City at the moment. And if we don't find the lions, we'll go back to that carcass and see if we can't enjoy the sight of the Walchers feeding. It is quite a sight. And as I've said to many of you before, I'm just not convinced about the number of Walchers that there are left in this area. If you'd had a carcass like that a little while back, the place would have been covered in Walchers. 
now it just doesn't happen anymore. Let's just have one quick look, David, also at a magpie shrike there. There we are. Just sort of enjoying the the breeze. There's some elephants coming through here. It's quite nice to see. I'm not sure where they're going to cross this drainage line. Going backwards, they are you pointing the camera in the right direction, Dave? Just a little difficult to see. There they are. You see that big termite mound with a hole in it? There. You got the elephant there? Ah, yes, well done. That's a different one, but that's okay, David. We'll take your one. Oh, the wonderful sound of the hardy down ibis in the morning. And I think this is round about where Byron had that rather astounding sighting of the failed hunt attempt yesterday evening, a morning, sorry, followed by a fairly vicious elephant attack on... There we are. That's the hole. That I was talking about. Here comes the elephant in front of it. There we go, young bull. And there's another one just behind, but you can't see him. You just can pick up the movement of his of his trunk. I think he'll come out into the open now. Oh. Margaret, a very good question to which I'm not sure that anyone fully understands the answer. You say, if elephants can reach leaves, why do they push trees over? Um, they can't always reach the leaves, so sometimes they do need to push the tree over in order to get to the leaves. Sometimes they push the trees over to get to the roots. That's certainly what they do with the cumbretum or bush willow trees. They push them over so that they can get to the roots. Um, I'm going to leave these chaps because they have a very thick bush. Uh, but sometimes they do it to open up the bark. Sometimes they do it when they're just frustrated. I've seen elephants push things over when they're frustrated. Sometimes they do it to kind of show off, it seems. Dave and I had a wonderful experience the other day with an enormous elephant bull who was he was just interested in us. And he came to within sort of two, or two meters of the vehicle, walked around the front of the car, and then he sort of very gently pushed over two trees next to us as if to show us how big and strong he is. Not that we were... Uh, under any misconceptions as to his strength or power, uh, but he showed us. And I don't know that he ate any of them, but it seems to be knob thorns especially that take that copper beating from them. To a certain extent, also um, uh, marula trees and the cumbretums as well, but uh, you know, I, you know, so often they will push the tree over, Margaret, as you say, and they'll take one or two bites and then they just move on. Oh, all right. Now, David, it was around here, was it? Do you remember exactly where? There was a runoff drainage that we can go down, was there? Okay. That's what we'll do. We'll ease our way in there and see what we can find. Yeah. Here we are. All their tracks going in here. Does this look familiar, David? N not right. A bit further on. I suspect it'll take us to the same spot. In fact, I'm 99% sure it will. Was it this one? No. Are you sure? We're about to arrive back at that buffalo cock, buffalo fellow, not the carcass. Yes, I think we might have. Okay. I'm going to go in 
on those other tracks because I think that's where everybody else came out. Strange wind blowing through the area everybody. Bit of a front coming through so maybe we won't have 36 degrees. Anyway, while we search, let's find out what's going on on Cheetah Plains and I'll hopefully have you some good news shortly. So we're here on Cheetah Plains. as she was bumbling along with her guests and she said she had some leopard tracks, she said female leopard tracks coming into Cheetah Again, driving very slowly, just having a game. Yeah, they're talking now. Lots of people have started on game. They'll just go drop. Now, they seem to have been coming east into Cheetah Plains, but there's a beautiful big drainage system just down here that runs in front of the Cheetah Plains Lodge. Now, obviously, we can't go driving right in front of the lodge, so we're just going to have to check carefully to see if this leopard has possibly popped out. Perhaps use the drainage line so we're coming, so we coming out to an area where it ends and hopefully we'll be able to have a quick little look around. So we'll just bumble on slowly. There's a couple of impalas so hopefully if there is anything around they'll also keep an eye out and let us know if they see anything. And I suppose that's a way that we communicate with the animals. Not like how I'd like to though. I'd obviously like to be able to have proper chats with them. But it's okay when they see something and they shout and scream, that's fine. Oh, a waterbuck. Thanks, Brian. A beautiful big waterbuck. Actually, let's get a, look, a gap here. And there he is. Hello, boy. Now, he's big. He's not particularly large in the sense that the splay of his horns is not wide. You can see it's quite narrow, but really beautiful nonetheless. Listening, something happening behind him, and, and then of course listening to me talking nonsense about him. Don't worry, Waterbuck, I'm saying, actually I wasn't saying very nice things about you, I must apologize. Maybe he's still a little bit young, but quite long horns. Now he's got both ears facing the other way, he didn't look too impressed. But don't worry, that, that's not him being unimpressed by us, that's just him listening what sounds like a tractor starting up in the distance. So very much like we wake up as the sun comes up when we get on and carry on with our game drives, well I suppose the maintenance team has to get up and start working too. And nobody likes to work when the sun is belting down at you at 12 o'clock during the day, especially in summer, so everybody tends to start a bit earlier out here and get their jobs done. Hello, little one. Now there's another one. Let's see if he's any bigger. He's got his head down on the ground though, but let's compare the two. Let's see if we can get a gap. Oh, he looks much bigger. You give your poppy's head up for us. He's just moving through the thicket though. But straight away you can see it looks as though he's got a wider splay of horns. In comparison, in body size, he does look much larger as well. Come on, mister, pop your head up so we can have a look at you. And it seems as though the waterbuck don't look too bad, though. You can see a couple of his ribs. You can see there, even through that fl fluffy coat. But they seem to be quite resilient during these times of the drought. And I find that they're quite strange because they just feed on grass. So when the grass disappears, it's always, I always think to myself, what are they eating? But maybe they eat so much in the summer months that they put on quite a bit of a, a, a sort of fat reserve and then they're able to utilize that during the drier months. He is beautiful. I really want to get a decent look at him, but now he's turning away and going into the distance. And when you're a waterbuck, obviously you've got a nice long tongue, not as long as a giraffe though. And you're able to use that to loop around the grass, or you can really just use your teeth and bite down on the grass too and pull it up. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. And we're looking from the back side, but he's a lovely boy.
Juan Belinda, you love the fact that a water buck's nose is shaped like a heart. I think that that's quite precious, of course. Now, even though they look slightly on the thin side, let's try and have a look at his nose. And it looks like his nose is still quite moist. Can you see that? And well, that's a very good indication when looking at animals, is if they have very dry, crusty noses, then you know that they're not doing too well, I'm afraid. But even though slightly on the more slender side, perhaps getting ready for summer, no, I'm only teasing, of course, they, they don't worry like us as humans to have your summer body ready. The plumper you are in the bush, the better, the healthier you are. I think I'd like to be a waterbuck, a hippo. It would be quite nice. I think let's move on from these two boys. Let's go up ahead. I think I can see a bird sitting on a fallen tree, but it's a bit far away, so we'll have to edge closer. I'm going to turn the radio up just a little bit. Thank you, Stephanie, for getting back to me about the ivory versus uh, tooth question. Now, you've said that the outside layer is made of dentine and is also covered in enamel. And I think that they're just completely differently designed compared to a normal tooth. Like I said, we've got quite a few birds here, but I'll, I'll show you now. Let's look at those ones first and see who's up there. And I think the fact and that they're not used in the same way as the teeth are used. They're more sort of used as digging tools. Who have we got here? It looks like we've got two Wahlbergs eagles. And it's not Mr. and Mrs. Pale form Wahlbergs that we have on Juma. This seems to be another pair of dark morphs. Isn't that lovely? And now we're watching them being quite affectionate towards each other. Oh, that is very nice. Hello. Oh, yes, we've caught you in the act. So it was quite interesting. So thanks, Stephanie, again. Just, sorry, just about the, the ivory. And I'm sure that in some way there'll be a couple more chemical compositions that'll be slightly different versus the tooth. I think the teeth on the outside, their tusks have to be quite resilient to, of course, digging and, as well as the males fighting. So clashing tusks, they need to be quite strong. Now they're just sitting here contemplating what to do for the rest of the day. Oh, maybe it is a juvenile. What do you think? You see how it's, its bill hasn't quite got as much yellow on it. I don't know if you noticed that, or maybe it's just dirty. But let, let's see if we can sneak over. And there's another bird I want to show you, but we'll get to that one in a moment. I'm quite interested in these, these little eagles now. Let's see. We've snuck up a little bit closer. Now, the behavior straight away, of course, looked to me like it was a mating pair. But the, the little eagle on the right didn't seem to have as yellow of a beak. Can you see that? But maybe it's just because it's slightly dirty. Yes, I think that that's the case. I think that that, that one has just got... Uh, a little bit of dirt or something on its beak that, that you can't see that yellow coming through quite nicely. Oh, isn't this lovely? Oh, lo look at them nibbling at each other. Now turn your volume up. Isn't that amazing? Now there's a very unwelcome drongo that's joined the party to the left. And I just want to show you how it's sort of watching these two eagles very carefully. Here it is. And you know very well that the drongos they must be the naughtiest birds in the bush and the bravest for, or for their size because they're known for mobbing big eagles or martial eagles, even to the African fish eagles. But hopefully this drongo won't bother these two eagles because they're not doing too much. They're just happily just sitting there sort of strengthening between the bottom. Oh no, it's mobbing the eagles now. That's not very nice. Did you see it come through? That's very rude. These two eagles are just minding their own business, Mr. Drongo. Obviously it's feeling left out. They don't seem to mind the Drongo too much though. Still showing each other some affection. That is so lovely.
we don't often get to see affection from ver from the birds and, and that's something that we're going to be seeing a lot of now is the courtship process between the various birds that are going to start building nests together and of course same as lions the same as humans grooming or sort of just touching rubbing your fingers through somebody's hair or you know scratching your dog behind the ears and we're all bonding with these various animals and this is a way that the birds are of course bonding with each other and maybe they have a nest nearby too don't let that drongo bother you though Isn't that lovely? Drongo starting to shout again, so I wonder if it's going to get ready for a surprise attack. There you go. <laughs> Leave them alone. What did they do to you, Drongo? Now, it's not that the drongo can really hurt these Warburg's eagles. It's more the fact that it, that drongo becomes an, a nuisance. And when you're an eagle and you get bopped on the head a couple of times, well, you'll only take it so much before you eventually give up. These eagles don't look like they're particularly interested in eating anything that's around them at the moment. They are so engrossed with themselves. Now, listen to the drongos now trying to mimic the call of the eagle. You hear that very high-pitched noise? That's not the eagles. <laughs> very typical of these drongos to do that. Now, James, you are wondering if these Wahlbergs will hunt in pairs. Not typically, because for quite some time of the year, they can spend their time alone and off they go. But if they find something large enough, and I reckon the other member is close by, let me just turn the radio down. Then I think that they will probably feed on the same on the same kill. So if they catch something, say like a young scrub hare, that's quite a bit of food to eat. Possibly during this courtship process, they will actually share that meal. Now that was really interesting to hear that forktail drongo mimicking the eagles. And I've heard them not only mimic other birds, but I've even heard them, well, one, mimicking a black back jackal before, which was unbelievable to hear. I was sitting in a herd of elephants, watching the elephants, and there were drongos flying around like we normally see them doing. And well, the next minute I heard this strange call, and I thought, that's bizarre. And out in the middle of the elephants came a young black-backed jackal, trying to dodge the feet of those big creatures. And uh, this fork-tailed drongo then started mobbing the jackal, but then also proceeded to start calling like one. Hmm, what are you doing now? It's a bizarre movement. I don't think I've ever seen a bird do that before. Ah, oh, wonderful. Well, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg's Eagle of Cheetah Plains. We're going to leave them in peace and let them carry on with the honeymoon period. But I believe James has finally got what he was looking for. I have to confess, everybody, I'm most relieved to have found what we have found here, but I've got to tell you, our performance this morning has been dire. We drive, drove straight past these lions, and thankfully the great veteran Ephraim of Cheetah Plains came past with his eyes open, and he managed to spot them. I must have been looking at the road when we came past here, uh, or looking for tracks or looking down perhaps towards some vultures or something but we drove straight past them uh, they're not more than pff, I don't know maybe 40 meters off the road <laughs> and thankfully Ephraim has come across today and they've killed another buffalo I will get you into a slightly better position 
and hopefully the rest of the pride will come up towards them. And let me just reverse, I'll just reverse slightly, sorry Dave, and then we can see them on the termite mound there, that's quite a cool picture. Wonderful. Now let's just count them. We've got one, two, th I think they're all here. All the females are here and now a couple of the cubs are coming back towards the kill. Oh, there's the one, the little floppy ear. And of course every little piece of meat that they eat is going to make a huge difference to their ability to get over their mange problem. And I think that this pride is doing exactly that. I think they're getting over it quite quickly now. Very little of that scratching going on. Now everybody, I must just berate you, you know, really, you've got, while I'm looking for tracks, you've got to be looking around the place, you know. You can't be relying on me to find everything, you know. So next time I expect just a little bit more effort from you lot there. Looking to the right while I'm looking left, looking to the left while I'm looking right, please. I cannot express to you the level of embarrassment I feel right now. <laughs> 40 meters, no, 30 meters from the road. <laughs> 13 lions <laughs> on a kill. Oh well. Can't win them all. Here they are. And Shark, you're absolutely right. As the streak goes on, I think what are we on now? We're probably on day, what, 65 or so of cats? 63 days of cats continuously? Well, it's just quite something. Most of those days, of course, made up by this fantastic pride of lions. And I just knew that when eventually they gave birth to cubs, we were going to have the best time. And I remember being, I mean, look, when we had just the five lionesses, I just remember being not, not bored by them, but I mean, it just was slightly sort of, um, yeah, well, you know, here are the five lionesses and then the Matimbas disappeared and the Birminghams went around and it just wasn't nearly as entertaining as it is now. Now we have all five lionesses and eight cubs. And, of course, lion cubs, quite possibly the most entertaining things you can watch in the bush, next to perhaps a, an art park. They're very quietly making a noise. The big fight over what to eat or, you know, who gets to eat is probably over. It probably finished sometime last night, I suspect. I wonder what time they killed it. They've had a really good go at this already, so I don't think it can be have been long after drive yesterday. So once you pulled out of the block there, the pride probably came knocking down here. Killed this buffalo. And have been eating here ever since. such fun and then there has just just the odd loud sort of deep throated grunt from the Inkahumas Inkahuma lioness that's the one that you can see in the background there let me just sneak slightly forward there's one tree that is rather precariously pulled into the way just ease our way forward and I think we'll get a better view of things. Can you still see the ones on the termite mound, Dave? Is that fine for you? Yep. There we are. Marvellous. Well, I think we'll probably spend a bit of time here then. <laughs> yeah, another... Uh, I mean... Yeah, this must have been killed last night, you know, because they weren't on a kill last night. There you can hear the mother getting a little bit cross. In fact, you know what? That deep throaty noise is coming from the cubs. And here 
here comes this one now thinking about having some more to eat and just in case you're wondering that black on their faces of course is not the mange at all it is the gore the gore from the buffalo so that is buffalo guts all over the face of that little lion cub and those buffalo guts all over that face of that little lion cub are going to be exactly the reason that they managed to survive this mange epidemic that decimated the Styx Pride. If you are a new viewer, remember we had the Styx Pride there on the far end of Cheetah Plains. They had eight cubs too. All of them died of the mange, but their mothers just weren't nearly as competent as the slot are at catching them food to eat. Now, Paula, I have to agree with you, and I'm finding it increasingly difficult to tell which you know which cubs are from which litter um you say you can't believe how big they're getting and how quickly it's happening well i have to agree with you i think it's just astounding but with this much buffalo to eat can you uh, it's not really surprising is it now the size of course that they end up as uh, as adults will probably as it does with humans have quite a lot to do with how good their sort of infant nutrition is and these chaps i think have had a phenomenally good time of it and if that continues to puberty I think you'll find that they're going to be pretty good sized lions <laughs> and already you know yes of course they are still playful at the just the edge of that really young cub playfulness that they used to have is it's just uh, it's not quite the same they're just not quite as playful as they used to be. But they will still play. Especially after they've had a good meal. You can see a patch of mange there on the elbow. Linda, what an interesting thought. I, I'm, I don't know, but I'm going to say no. Uh, you say... Is it possible that the salt in the ground has helped with the itching? I'll tell you why I'm going to say no. I, because it didn't help with the Styx Pride, and the Styx Pride, of course, are they're in a pretty salty area, basically. That entire clearing at Cheetah Plains is a, is a sodic area. It's a salty area, and it didn't help them in the slightest. So no, I don't think that was the case at all. Um, I just think it's food. I think it's food that they've eaten. I think it's... Um, uh, also the fact that they have lived in a sort of more salubrious environment, if you like, their mothers and aunts have been that much more effective at killing. I remember way back, just as the Styx Pride got mange, those mothers weren't spending any time with their cubs. The cubs were in that dam on their own, and the mothers didn't catch anything. They just didn't seem to be able to, to bring themselves to catch anything. And I think, you know, it's interesting... If you're a lioness on your own, you apparently you eat as well as lionesses in prides of three or four more. So I think you're going to find that a pride of three out here struggles to find sufficient to eat. Whereas a pride of five, of course, well, they're big enough to take out big prey like buffalo. And as we said at the very beginning of the drought, we said for some of these animals, the drought's going to be a boom time, and it certainly has been for the Nkuhumas. The sticks, not so much. And maybe because things like the wildebeest moved off, and the zebra, zebra's pretty big for three lionesses. They don't seem to be particularly effective at killing them either. That, that noise you can hear is not an adult. That's the females making that noise. <laughs> not the females, the cubs, it's the little cubs making that noise. They've got a long way into this carcass in the space of time that they've been here. Now there is a male lion on Torchwood, which obviously we can't go to, but quite interesting that he's this close and not, he's clearly not aware of this kill because I think he'd probably have wandered in here. But apparently he too has eaten. He's looking pretty fat. 
That's just fantastic. <laughs> I don't think that that cub's appreciation of the laws of gravity are particularly strong yet. That's it. Oh dear, yeah. Oh. Heavy backside. <coughs> a small leopard almost. Yeah, I'm just going to keep you posted as to what's going on at Torchwood because I know we're all can, interested in the fate of the Birminghams. There are another, another males joining that one there. I don't know which two they are. But um, it's quite interesting that they are there and not here. Hello, Spara. Um, we were talking about the sticks' pride, and they're kind of they're a small pride, and and their ability to to survive seems to be compromised by the size of the pride. So three, probably not quite as good as four, and three definitely not as good as one. And you're wondering if perhaps they'd ever think about joining this pride. They can't really do that because they're not related. But the Styx Pride used to be that Styx Pride... Oh, I'm just listening to the radio quickly. Okay, Taxon's just saying that they are on a kill, the two males. Right. The Styx Pride used to be much bigger than it is, and I think that for a while this group of sticks that we know was known as the Styx Breakaway Pride. So what happen is what happens is that the uh, the pride can the pride can split, go off on its own, and then yes, it could join up again. That's happened with a few prides that I know of. But what's interesting here is that the sticks, of course, are not uh, related to the Ngohumas, and therefore the chances of them joining up with the unrelated lionesses. Remember, all these lions are, are related to each other: sisters, cousins, and aunts. Uh, I think you'll find that it's impossible for the sticks to join up here. It wouldn't advantage the Inkahumas at all. I think five is really the ideal number if you want to eat buffalo around here, with a little bit of help from males every now and again. <coughs> Robin D, quite apart from what the uh, Lion King would have you believe, lionesses do not like to spend time with uh, the males. I'm just going to turn my radio down here because it's getting a bit loud in my ear. And you're saying here, Robin, you say, would the, the Nkuhumas seek out the Birminghams? No, they wouldn't. They would absolutely not. The Birminghams play a uh, the advantage to the Birminghams, or the, the advantage to the Inkahumas for the Birminghams, is that the Birminghams look after the territory and make sure that no other males come into the area. One of the Birminghams, or a few of the Birminghams, are, have got offspring here, but otherwise there is no point in the lionesses spending time with the males, unless there are other males in the area, which there aren't. It doesn't help them because the males will steal their food. They will cause trouble by trying to mate with females who don't want to mate. They will not be particularly effective at any hunt because they tend to just hang back until the main work has been actually done by the females. They will, they can hunt, they have to hunt if they want to eat. And so what you find is that a kill like this, they try and, I mean, they don't make an attempt, I don't think, to be quiet, but you'll find that they won't roar. So for example, if a Birmingham boy calls in the distance, these lionesses, you can watch. it's very interesting to watch. They'll look, listen to the call, and then they carry on eating. They don't respond. They won't call the males in. So they absolutely don't seek them out. Unless one of them's in estrus, then she might seek out a male. But as far as the life of the pride goes, they don't want to spend time with the males. The male adds no value. 
to the pride now. He has far more value by being around the place defending his big territory from other males. Now, Bill, you have fallen, or well, not fallen victim, but you've certainly been um, perhaps semi-persuaded of the notion that a lioness is able to hold uh, a male's sperm for up to three months before actually conceiving. No, Bill, that's not true. It's uh, one of those sort of bush misconceptions that's come about, I think, through some pretty inaccurate uh, viewing of lions and I think the reason that and I'll tell you about a few others uh, because they're relevant to this time of year I think the key thing about that one Bill is that when males come into an area females come into what we call proto estrus or an estrus which means they come into an estrus cycle but they don't ov ovulate and so the males mate with them then what happens is the females sometime after that that, there's a lioness has seen something there, Dave. You see, she's looking. I'm not sure what she's looking at. She just turned and suddenly looked towards the north. Maybe another elephant coming through here. Anyway, nothing so far. Bill, and then they'll come into proper estrus and ovulate later, and then mate again. But to store um, sperm, no, I really don't think it's possible at all. And I think it comes from that gap. So you see a lioness mating. Three months later, um, perhaps you don't see them mating again, and then three months after that, they give birth. And I think it's just missing, you know, somewhere in the middle there, it's missing the second mating period. So they won't conceive the first time very often. Now, at this time of the year, of course, we're going into the impala lambing season, and during the impala lambing season, uh, <coughs> the greatest bush uh, legend, if you like, uh, outright lie if you're a little bit harsher is that impala will keep or hold back their babies until the conditions are favorable now you know you will hear guides around the place still to this day tell you that if impala if the conditions are not favorable the ewes can hold back their babies until february now that's ridiculous that means three or four months of a fetus living inside a female not growing well if it carried on growing obviously birth would become completely impossible and so no it's a, that's absolutely not possible of course if, if conditions are not great then they could easily spontaneously abort the fetus and that sort of thing could happen but no that doesn't happen and the reason that that misconception came about is because there's a second impala breeding season which people fail to notice that happens in September one or just a few probably probably only five percent or so of the lionesses will fall pregnant in the September sessions and then they give birth in February why you'd eat wood if you could eat buffalo maybe it's sort of like a toothpick Kirsten says it looks like it's falling asleep holding onto that stick. Alrighty, let's head back to Cheetah Plains and Taylor and get an update from them. We're going to sit with these lions for a bit longer and we'll see what transpires here. <laughs> 